What's up? Welcome to another episode of What's Up Conversations, a podcast with icons and legends of the video game industry and those who influenced them. In this episode, I have a veteran from the audio world of video games. He's one of the most experienced and coolest audio directors out there, with memorable games such as Painkiller, Gears of War, Judgment, Fortnite, and Outriders. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Marcin Chartinsky from People Can Fly. In this very educational episode, Marcin and I talk about his background and stories working on famous games, his way of mixing crowded games, sound designing, ambience, creatures and weapons. Each section is divided into chapters and you can find timestamps in the description of this video or audio on wherever you're getting your podcast. Before starting out, please consider donating to What's Up Conversations and help us grow from the link in the description. Also, it would be great to hit the like, subscription and follow and introduce us to your friends and colleagues. For more information, please check out nikufarmusic.com and follow my Twitter at hrnikufar. Thank you for watching or listening. Let's go. One, two, three, take. <laughs> yeah. Now, here's your pick. Now you can sing. <laughs> yeah. Hello and welcome to What's Up Conversations, Marcin. It's so great to have you here. I play, I've been playing Outriders since uh, day one, and I'm loving it so much. As a sound designer myself, I know how difficult this project must have been for you and your team. But in the end, it's juicy as fuck, man. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Appreciate yeah. that. So uh, let's go uh, back and uh, talk about your life. How did you just start your career? Was it something you always wanted to do? And how did you get your how did you get your first gig? Actually, I'm one of the lucky guys on this planet who always wanted to create music or sound design for the games. Yeah, yeah. Since I got my first computer, and that was Atari 65XE, an eight-bit machine, a wonderful <laughs> piece of gear. Uh, and its direct competition was the famous Commodore 64. So I was able to take the parts, to take a part in this computer war, uh, wars, you know, between the users of one platform against the another, and so on and so forth. So since I got that computer, uh, of course, first year or two I spent mostly playing. <laughs> Let's <laughs> <Yeah>. be honest. <laughs> so, yeah. so first year or or two, I literally spent mostly playing and breaking joysticks. Uh, the funny thing that I remember, uh, cause, you know, in, in every country I have this summer break, yeah, for the, for the kids going to school. Yeah. So when I first got my computer, that was in the winter, uh, at the end of the year, cause I got that on, on Christmas, 1988, actually. And after that, I was kind of limited by my parents on my playing time, which meant that, you know, I could play like two, three hours per day max. That's it. Then you need to, you know, do your school stuff and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. But I was promised that uh, if the school will go well, then I will have all the vacation without any limitations for the computer. So, you know, I did my best and, and school went well. <laughs> and on the first vacation, I was totally sunk into that computer, into, you know, playing games. Uh, I was literally spending like 12, 13 hours just playing the games. I was waking up, loading the game, playing it, next game, playing it, and so on and so forth. <laughs> and funny thing, because in Poland, summer break lasts for two months, yeah? yeah? So month and a half has passed, and I was still in my honeymoon with, uh, with the computer <laughs> games playing. And after that month and a half, it's like one day I just woke up, I loaded the game, and I played for like 15 or 20 minutes. And then I realized that, yo, dude, actually it's like two weeks, and then you're getting back to school. And you haven't been outside. You haven't played the ball. You haven't, you know, chased. <laughs> you haven't been chasing the guys. You haven't riding a bike. You just did nothing. You're sitting in your room for a month and a half, and you, and you're playing games. God damn it! <laughs> Within the next hour, the the computer like went to trash. <laughs> I just switched <laughs> it off. You know, <laughs> I went outside. Next two weeks, no computer whatsoever. Just back to your stone with... age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Back, back to the Stone Age, you know, back to back to regular analog entertainment <laughs> and so on and so forth. But uh, that is like one of the first uh, experiences I I remember with uh, uh, having a new machine and uh, or a new computer. Yeah, so uh, it gave me that feeling that yeah I can sink into something, but on the other hand, you know, I have a common sense to break it when I 
when I notice that 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 it takes over my life. Yeah. And next thing was like 1992. There was a guy called Janusz Peltz, Polish programmer. He wrote software called Chaos Music Composer, very popular on the Atari platform. We had the three channels uh, accessible for the for the audio. Uh, actually, Atari has a four channels, but this one had only three because you could put two channels together and create 16-bit samples. And that was the practically that was the the year that I started composing a music because I got that software. And I was always very keen on playing some instruments because my father is a musician. He plays the drums. So very often after the gigs, he used to bring the electronic keyboards, you know, borrow them from his colleagues and he used to bring them home so that, you know, I can play with them. Therefore, I had like kind of experience or in-depth look of how the future music will look like. And when I got that software to compose the music, you know, first thing was, okay, I, I need to try it. I need to try, you know, to create some sounds, which was, trust me, that was very, very weird because you because you actually had an access to, not to a traditional score notation when you write a note or not to a traditional more or less traditional piano roll. Uh, the thing was created in form of a tracker, which later on was very popular on Amiga. Sorry, not later on. Trackers were already popular, and that guy wrote the first tracker for the little for the little Atari, and I started using that. Uh, getting out of getting out some sounds, even the simplest ones was a challenge at that time you know because because that wasn't a uh analog synthesizer known to the rest of the humanity you didn't have knobs you didn't have the os oscillation nothing like that uh i mean you had then oscillators but you had to drive them or handle them in a very very different way than you would be doing that on a traditional synthesizers which meant no knobs you're only typing digits yeah changing the bits yeah, and if you change the bits in a proper way, then you were getting in interesting sounds. Yeah, so that was the year when I started my composing business. <laughs> and to be quite honest, uh, I got hooked up. I got really, of course, these were very simple tunes, very childish when when I look at them these day. Actually, they are accessible on the internet. It's called Atari Something Musician Database (ASMA). So if someone will want to take a look then you know this person can go to to the database and download that my stuff and and the rest of the composing guys but the thing is that i started doing that with the 8-bit atari i got hooked up to the composition and it lasted i don't know maybe, maybe one year maybe year and a half and after that there was a new software written by some other Polish blokes from the Polish demo scene. And that software allowed people to use actual samples on that 8-bit machine, which meant that uh, actually you had access to two channels of synthesized stuff being yeah. fed straight out, out of the pokey and also two channels of a sampled goodness. Uh, having in mind that this computer had only 64 kilobytes of RAM, you obviously were limited to using just the short samples, you know. So mainly these two channels was, were sacrificed for creating drums or drums, drums patterns or uh, bass patterns, yeah. But at the end of the day, uh, if you knew how to compose from a technical standpoint, use, uh, and if you know the limitations of your machine, you ended up with four channels where two of them were you're synthesized and two of them could be sampled, which gave very, very, very nice results, yeah? And of course, you know, I was doing my stuff, composing on that computer. Then uh, suddenly I became a part of the demo scene, which was and still is probably a subculture dedicated to creating computer art mainly in real time. Uh, Back in the old days, that was a real challenge because you had to uh, create very complicated graphical, very complicated graphics using very, very limited resources. 
uh, to such an extent that there was a uh, Wolfstein implemented on uh, 8-bit Atari. There was a real 3D world implemented on 8-bit Atari. The same stuff goes for the for the Commodore, yeah? So the programmers were really, really, really skilled. And uh, the demo scene mainly was based on a bunch of people coming to a single place called a copy party where the people were exchanging software between, between e each other. But the cherry on top was that each copy party had a competition. And these competitions were in a different categories. Music, mainly music, of course. Who, who's going to draw the picture, which is the nicest? The same goes for the music. Who's going to compose the nicest music using specific platform? Yeah, but the demo scene was actually, but the demo was actually a multimedia presentation, usually lasting for ten to fifteen minutes, with filled with the animations being calculated in real time, which meant two two dimensional effects. Some three-dimensional effects like the usual stuff was the 3D rotating cube, then 3D rotating cube with a go-out shading, then 3D <laughs> rotating cube with a go-out shading with the textures on. Then another iteration wow. was 3D rotating cube with a go-out shading textures on and environmental pong effect uh, and so on and so forth. So I became a part of that. Uh, basically, this environment allowed me to grew as a musician and as a composer because that was actually a very competitive environment, you know. There were many, many talented people all over the Europe because that thing mainly took part in in Europe, like Poland, Germany, uh, the guys from Scandinavia, they were like, whoa, great, man. Actually, the guys from Scandinavia are the, are the same guys who created first Max Payne, straight yeah. from the demos. Oh, scene, yeah. You know, they jumped to create a proper AAA title, which was like, wow. Uh, so this lasted for some time. I think that up to maybe 2000, something like that. And uh, mainly it looked like that, that we were traveling, that, you know, a bunch of peoples, because uh, ah, uh, peoples were connecting, um, people were hooking up together uh, and forming the demo scene groups. Yeah, so each group had a name. Each member of the name is supposed to have a nickname. By the way, my nickname comes comes from my kindergarten, and that was my nickname on the demo scene as well. So long time. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and mainly, you know, we were busy with our private school lives. We were teenagers back then. And after school, lots of people were creating stuff, were creating content for those computers. You know, the graphic guys were doing their graphics, the composers were composing their music, and the programmers were, you know, cooking up the best 3D code they could possibly imagine. And then at some point, and then, you know, we lived from one party to another. Because uh, when, when you were traveling at the party, you're supposed to bring something with you. Which means I, as a composer, well, was expected to bring some music and put it in the competition. The same goes for the graphics. But the group had to had to bring a demo presentation and to create a demo presentation. That is an actually kind of complicated programming project, kind of complicated engineering project because you need to connect, you know, graphics plus music plus the code, which takes time. But in ev but every party there was a plenty of demonstration programs which took part in the competitions and each group were bringing their product and then you know they we were just like putting that in the competition people were voting the best group won so basically that was a mixture of real artistic bohem environment a kindergarten for future very serious programmers a very good school and one of the and i think that Last but not least, great party, man. Great party. You could meet <laughs> literally very weird people, like you know, boys, girls, whatever. You could you could meet seriously very, very weird people. Some people, you know, from the serious computer industry, some geeks, some nerds, some whatever guys. You could learn from them. Guys were sharing experience. Uh, and that was, of course, backed up with a solid dose of, of the alcohol. <laughs> yeah. uh, but the main point was that people were actually meeting at these events and they were actually discussing what is known today as the nerd or geek stuff. 
Yeah. Yeah. They were talking to each other about how to create the best possible effect, how to create the fastest code to render 3D graphics and so on and so forth. So that actually gave me solid background for my professional career. Without even knowing, I was learning by that time. Yeah. I always knew that I want to be composer. I always knew that I want to create audio for the games or the or the music for the games. But I didn't start from that. I started from the demo scene, yeah. And 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 after sitting there for like I don't know seven years, something like that, maybe six years, six seven years, uh, we get. Gathered with a bunch of guys from my hometown platforms, but some, somehow we just got hooked up with each other and we decided, okay, now it's time to create a game. Let's do a game. If we can create a demo product, which contains all the key elements, all the three key elements, working code, great graphics, plus the, the music, then we should be able to create a game. And we started working on that. However, Creating a game isn't that simple as creating a demo because the product is much larger. The scope is much larger. The project is much bigger. So that's the one thing. Second thing, the game is an interactive product where the demo were only a presentations, which meant you load the, the you were loading the, de- the demo and you were watching. That's it, one way, like in a TV. But with a game, there are interactions. Player can put his input, can you know drive the game, can create scenarios within given rules and so on and so forth, which means that this is more complicated. So we started working on that. Then we had our first prototype or our technical demo. And actually we found a publisher in Poland, a company that decided to give us a money to finish that product. And we started working on that game. The name of the game was Starmageddon, uh, published in 2001 or 2002, something like that. Uh, and that was our first serious production. The production lasted for, I think, a year and a half. And basically, that game was kind of copycat of the whole world, which meant 3D RTS based in space, but created in Poland by the Polish people. And that was like my first real gig when it comes to the games. Earlier, I've been scoring some games on... on, on, uh, on Atari, but they were like a small titles. That was a first serious title. Yeah. And it took like, as I'm saying, a year and a half or something like two years to create that from a scratch, from point blank to a full game. Yeah. And that meant that for the first half of the year, we've been struggling to find a proper publisher. Then we found a proper publisher. You know, these, the money started to flow. Uh, and I remember that they hired us a private villa in Polish capital Warsaw because they wanted to have and the whole development team on on the spot, yeah, just to just to have a control over us. And we were living there for over a year. So, uh, and by this time, the crew grew up from. We started at in I don't know five people. Wait a second. Uh, we started with six or seven people, and at the end of the day, the, at, at the end of the day, there was like about thirty people involved in the project. Uh, so you could see that you know the team has been expanding. Yeah. So yeah, that was my first gig, and after that, after that, I was lucky enough to 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 uh, to hook up with the People Can Fly, for which I'm working until this day, to be quite honest. And we created a painkiller. That was a very proper first Polish shooter. Uh, what's funny about that game is that when we've been creating that, it took us, okay, it took us like, because we started creating that in 2002, something like that, and the game was published at 2004 or 2005, or maybe 2004. Uh, the scope was much bigger, the team was much bigger, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the funny thing about this game is that it had a great multiplayer. And that multiplayer was such a cool thing that after 
working on the project, I was still hooked up in in playing over the network with the other players for the next year and a half, just for kicks, yeah, just for fun, you know. So, so yeah, a uh, lot of fun doing that. A lot of fun doing that uh, game. Uh, that was actually the project when I kind of learned how to create a proper field recordings with the limit with the very limited resources that I had. Because you need to remember that was 2002. Yeah. Getting a handy field recorder was like very expensive thing, man. Definitely beyond the definitely beyond the, the, the budget. So you had to sort things out in the in the other way. Yeah. Uh so yeah that was the, so how was old like were you when I, you worked I, on uh, painkiller? Hmm? How old were you when you worked on painkiller? How old was I? Whoa, man, 20 something. Wow. Man, 20 I was something. 11 years I old. I started. <laughs> Pardon? I was 11 years old when that when that game came out. <laughs> yep, man. And I was 20 something. <laughs> 20 something. So so yeah, you know, we've I've been working on that. Uh mainly I took control over the ambience and, and, and all the environmentals that are in game. Yeah. Uh, I, I also had an uh, kind of limited influence on creating the battle soundtrack, but that was kind of beyond me. Yeah. But uh, everything that goes on in the games in this game when you're not fighting, when you're just wandering around and you're picking up the the, the loot or discovering a secret, so most of the audio is like done by me. All the climatic stuff, all the and and environmentals, all the ambience, you know, that's like my job, yeah. Plus the plus the the music. What is what is surprising to me that is that until this very day I can find various videos on the YouTube with the environments from this game, with only environments from this game being recorded, you know, with the picture and the audio and and, and in lots of cases the camera is just like hang somewhere and the ambience is just working. You know, wow. the music is playing and you can sing into the ambience, create the the immersion. But that was like a <laughs> kind of weird type of the game because you know, the main protagonist was the, was a guy who recently died, and right now he's trying to get out of the purgatory. You know, through fighting a demons to heaven. Therefore, uh, therefore, the field of exploration for the audio was like very broad. You know, you could go to the abstract stuff. Uh, you could hook up yourself on the things that are real. But not necessarily. Mostly, we've been mostly we've been pushing the audio towards the very abstract stuff because you know you're you're the game is taking place in let's let's face it in a dream world, you know. So everything can happen, yeah. So yeah, that was that was the painkiller. Later on, the bullet storm kicked in uh, with the big titles because uh, meanwhile I was doing you know some stuff for the for the smaller project but the next bigger project for me was the bullet storm when actually i was <laughs> studying in london i went to london to study ah. the acoustics and, and 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 to gain the knowledge on the audio engineering you know because i figured out that uh that's the best place in europe where i can get my education you know the second biggest industry music industry on the planet, the Brits. So if anyone in here on the continent is able to tell me something about the audio, it's going to be them. Okay, let's go there, you know. So I, I went there and I was studying my my, my stuff. Uh, and at some point, you know, I, I got the call from the PCF again. Dude, we're working on the bullet storm. We need you there. Yeah, man, but I'm like studying in <laughs> London. You know, I... I will not break the school. <laughs> yeah, but we need you there. Yeah, but I'm studying. Yeah, but we need you there. Okay, <laughs> let's meet it. Let's meet the halfway. Yeah. <laughs> so first, I started working with them remotely uh, as a remote sound designer. And after the year, after the school year was done, you know, I took a break from a school and I came to 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 Warsaw, you know, to to work in 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 house on the on the on the bullet store and. 
that game was like a completely different type of beast than than the previous one because that was a proper triple A title, yeah. Big with a big scope, with the, uh, loads of iterations, with loads of stuff <laughs> being created, then you know thrown back, uh, thrown away, reiterated, and so on and so forth. Uh, what can I tell you? Great ride, to be quite honest. We had a very talented team of composers. I was responsible for the part, for part of the sound design. Adam Skorupa was responsible for the other part of the sound design. We had a backup from the Epic guys. They were backing us up with their skills, knowledge, and resources. There was also a great sound designer whose name is Joey Kuras with a great portfolio and lots of, lots of, lots of experience. And what can I say? You know, we were doing the, we were doing the, the, the stuff for the bullet storm, which was, okay, that was still a shooter. That was, but the thing was that that game was pulp. That game was taking place in a real environment. And since it's a pulp, you could allow yourself for lots of over-the-top sounds, bigger than life, and so on and so forth, yeah? So the whole audio, the whole vision of the audio was that we're going to provide a audio presentation, which by its very definition sounds bigger than life. So if we have a player who walks over the some kind of surface, he needs to sound tough. His footsteps needs to be tough. If we have a guy who is like half cyborg because of the crash at the beginning, yeah, because when the game starts, uh, you know, there is this big crash, and and one of the main protagonist teammates is accidentally getting converted into half cyborg bloke. <laughs> so. That guy needs to have a, that guy is half cyborg, like his one leg is totally cybernetic, therefore it needs to sound big. You know, it needs to be over the top. Everything needed to be over the top with this game. Big guns, big powers, uh, and the audio had to back this up along with the, along with the music. So our main, our main goal was to create a load of noise which sounds over the top, and yet somehow everything cuts through the mix. That was like the biggest challenge. Because the game could get because the game could get busy in some in some moments. And in some moments the game was getting very busy, trust me. Like you had many opponents on the screen and you know they were like screaming, shooting to you, and still your main weaponry had to cut through. Still you had to be fully aware of where your teammates are where your sidekicks are on the map and this had to be telegraphed by their audio mainly and on top of that you had a very dynamic soundtrack which was actually a dynamic and adaptive system of music which was changing dynamically to the situation on the screen yeah and uh, Things were getting very, very busy in in terms of you know number of the enemies being spawned on the map, and somehow you had to cut through. Therefore, uh, loads of bandwidth works had to be done, which means that we literally had to uh, cut out certain frequencies out of the enemies out of the enemies' guns so that they are not masking our players guns yeah because the player guns you know needed to sound like fully bandwidth everything that player does needs to be over the top and and needs to be full bandwidth yeah and on top of that you need to be aware where your enemy is shooting from you need to be aware where your sidekick is shooting towards the enemies and on top you have the music which like covers everything <laughs> So that was that was the biggest challenge to how to balance things uh, using what we have. And back then we were working on the Unreal Engine 3 audio, which was like very, very, very limited comparing to, to what came next. Yeah, uh, During the creation of Bulletstorm, many additions to the audio engine has been done, has been programmed, has been created, you know, by internal programmers. One of them was the adaptive music system that was like a homegrown stuff. Uh, 
many other things has been has been added just to make this game sound right, yeah. And yeah, and after doing this, uh, the next one was Gears. The next one was Gears of War, which was kind of easier than doing a Bulletstorm because first of all, you has we has been working on the on the brand new IP. We already had the world created. Yeah, we just yeah. had to improve it. We just had to up, upgrade it, you know, with the new stuff. Uh, and so that was the one thing. Second thing in terms of audio, yes, we still were working on Unreal Engine 3. But this time, oh, we were creating a game with all the tools that we used on the previous game, on the, on a previous game, on a Bulletstorm, which meant that the audio system was extended by our, by the staff that we created for the bullet storm, yeah? Yeah. Whoa, man, you're breaking. Hello, yeah. Yep. So, right. so, what can I say? Uh, there was definitely easier implementation of the audio for the, for the gears than for the, for the previous game. Uh, the scope of the game was like a similar and, the, and, and another thing that was easing the task was that we are working on the world which is already there which means that a lot of stuff is done you had to add stuff on top of that and you don't have to uh, search for different visions or for alternatives because a lot of stuff is defined yeah in some cases we couldn't even change a thing or or two because that was a part of the lore yeah yeah so that 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 made the things that made things easier. What can I say about Gears of War? Uh, luckily, I was hooked up with uh, with a very skilled composer, the guy who wrote the music for Transformers, Steve Jablonski, or Steve Jablonski, as the Americans yeah. would, would say. And he created and he created very nice soundtrack for the Gears. One of I remember that we we specifically asked for changing a little direction in gears because we wanted to go away from that orchestration arrangements which were like a signature style for the gears we wanted to make a game sounding a little bit more electronic one of the reasons behind such a decision was that this game was taking that was not another part of the franchise that the the timeline was not after the events which were presented in Gears of War 3. That was a spin-off. So the stuff has been, you know, taking place before the whole invasion started and before, and before the locust emerged and, you know, there was this big war. Therefore, we therefore we decided that that fourth dimension which comes through the music needs to be a little different from, from the original series, yeah? from the original gears because we are passing a different emotion we are not in this destroyed beauty world which was a signature for the for the visuals of the gears and that was like the the the, the whole graphical vision and also the audio vision for the for the previous games right now this game takes place before everything went south which means that the buildings are still there, the cars are still there, the, the society and, and the civilization is still there. This game needs to look different than the other games. This game needs to sound different than the other games. That's your challenge. This is where you want to go. And I believe that <clears throat> we succeeded because um, that game sounds a bit, in, especially in terms of music, that game sounds different than the rest of the series. That game is different, and the sole reason for that was, okay, it's a different world. We need a different musical illustration to that, yeah? Uh, it doesn't mean that we uh, that we didn't use the orchestration, because <laughs> we used that a lot, but uh, but the main focus was to provide a uh, something fresh, something different, you know, from the other installments of the of the game, so that player will have a different, kind of different experience than done with the previous games yeah yeah so that's the thing wow what what a great career and 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 uh not only in poland but i mean considering the whole gaming industry man yeah, you've man. been around for like that's, 
uh, yeah, that's that's not the end because the next challenge was the Fortnite. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> Fortnite. Working, yeah, a little game called yeah. Fortnite. <laughs> a little, a little known game called Fortnite. <laughs> yeah. That was our next challenge. Yeah. And, and that was like totally different, you know, because the game has been proce- procedural. Ah, hard work. The game has a procedural generation of the terrain, yeah? Yeah. Which means that you, you know, cannot put manual sounds over there. You need to generate that in, 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 in real time, yeah? So you need to come up with the new systems for the audio generation. Oh. Uh, and these systems need to work. They need to be stable and they need to, and the pieces of the puzzle need to fit all together, yeah? And I'm not talking about the player's mechanics, which is like kind of traditional one. Uh, but I'm talking about the whole environment, the the the, the, the music, you know, the, the foundations, the building and so on and so forth. So that was another challenge. Uh, <laughs> one of the funny things was that uh, when we're doing the Fortnite, actually you could, uh, the maps were much smaller. So you could like very easily jump out of the map, yeah? Or build something which is very, 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 very high, yeah? Uh, so we had to have a kind of protection against that and make sure, for for example, that the wind is playing high enough above the map terrain so that uh, the player will oh, first yeah. die before they will reach the, the end of the sound. So that was a totally different kind of base because yeah that was a shooter <laughs> that was a stuff that was a looter shooter or something that could be called as a looter shooter uh you had a crafting over there and we need to remember that the fortnite was was coming into life in the times where minecraft was like mind-boggling and very popular stuff yeah and that was a fresh so the epic guys wanted exactly the same stuff in in their game you go there you uh, you gain resources, then you craft something out of it, and and then you're trying to to survive the 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 night. Yeah. Yeah. So the game had to be much more dynamic than the previous games that I've been working on, which meant also dynamic environment, different times of the day. So and and you know if the game changes, the audio needs to change as well. <laughs> uh, so these were the completely different challenges than than the ones on the on the on the previous games and yeah i think that uh, that they has been fulfilled in a good manner because look the game is still alive and running <laughs> and 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 i believe that some of my work or maybe a lot of my work is still there in the game. I have no idea how much because I didn't have time to play the game recently. So honestly, I have no idea how the game looks like. So were you on the project when it no turned comment. to uh, Battle Royale game? Pardon? I mean, uh, were you on the project, were you working on Fortnite when it turned out to be a Battle Royale game? Uh, no, we've been split back then. Oh, yeah. We've started the Arthritis back then, you know, because the Fortnite oh, yeah. turned Battle Royale in 2016, something like that. Yeah. yeah. So, so back then we've been like, you know, in a in a in a very different place. Yeah. So back then we've been doing something else. <laughs> You've been working on Outriders. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's Outr- the name of a game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Outriders was your next game, which is uh, a fantastic game. Your best work yet. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I have so many questions. Uh, first, let's uh, tackle the locations and ecosystem of the game. I mean, uh, creating a whole new sound palette for each location. The game happens in so many different locations with different environments. How did you approach that? And uh, what's the best way to create ambient sounds? regarding the uh, varied location of Outriders? Knowing the... You need to know the world you're working on. Yeah. That's the idea. Therefore, you need to have a very good information flow with the designers. Because these are the guys who are creating the world. You need to know their thoughts and their vision you need to talk to them very often yeah yeah so first stage is usually loads of talkings 
lots of meetings and lots of talkings about how the game will look like. Yeah. Well, then usually you do the prototype and the game, you know, is is starting to come to shape. And the next and and the next step usually is that you're starting to see the picture. You're starting to see how the game will finally look like. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, you're not focusing on a single place in the game. Yeah. You're going broad. Therefore, you're you're trying different uh, approaches. The same process was with the bullet storm. The same process was was with the gears and so on and so forth. We were designing the environment for the game, and when you know how the environment will look like, you know what to search in terms of audio, because you know that you're gonna that this game you're working on is gonna have. Let's take the Outriders as an example so you know that this game that you're working on is going to have those world war one trenches you know that this game is gonna take place for loads of for load of its time in a location that is being locked by some force and you can you know get away from this you know that this force that is keeping you in abstract, we're talking about the anomaly, you know, driving the, the, the planet. This is something ab- abstract, you know, and this starts to draw a soundscape in a head because you know where the game is going to take place. Then you know that part of the game will be driving through forests. Okay. Of course, you know that this is not going to be the ordinary forest like you see on Earth, that it's going to be different. And then you start talking about that. <clears throat> and then you're finding out that, yeah, man, this is going to be a really dark and creepy place. And, you know, this is going to be the place where it's better not to go. Because if you're going to go there, you're probably going to die. Yeah. Oh, okay. So that's another piece of the puzzle. Okay. So we're in this forest. It's going to be dark, gloomy. Okay. Full of whispers, full of, you know, demons of the past or whatever. Yet at the same time, when talking to the to the creative guys, uh, uh, to the guys you know providing the overall vision of the game, you know that this forest will be soaked with the anomaly because you know this is like the forest is the external barrier of the world that you're living in, of that of that no man's land wasteland where the people are fighting you know over the scraps that they have. That is an actually quotation from the game, I think. Uh, but uh, so you are fully aware that, okay, this place, this forest is full of the anomaly, full of weird stuff, full of weird creatures, really, really weird creatures. This, you know, starts to bring the vision in, in, in the head of, in your head of how this bit of the game should sound like. It doesn't even have to see it. You know, you have the concept artist, who are concepting the environments. You can take a look at, at that and you can start imagining what type of soundscape would you put in that forest. Yeah, then the next thing, you know, <coughs> that at the end of the game, we're, we're going to have a desert and the things will take place in the desert. Therefore, we completely need to change the mood. We need to, you know, switch from the uh, human civilization fighting over the scraps we need to switch out from the tribal forest, you know, tribal like South American rhythms or South American jungle stuff to so something which comes from the Middle East because it's a desert, you know. That's yeah. the that's the only corresponding place on Earth we we know. Yeah. Therefore, you know that you will have to change the tonality of the of the audio, of the assets, of the whole soundscape. Yeah. Uh, I am a great fan of investing many hours in the game's ambience because I believe that the game's ambience is exactly the same, does for the game exactly the same stuff as the meshing do, as the proper visual decorations, yeah? Uh, It allows the games to live and breathe. It allows the player to immerse in the world, like completely, because you are creating the illusion of the real world, yeah? And the fastest, and and I personally believe that the fastest and the most effective way of achieving that goal is to create a convincing ambient soundscape. 
especially with the games like Outriders, which is a looter shooter where you actually spend a lot of time, you know, running from one place to another in search for the loot. Of course, when you when you know where the loot is, then you're doing it very, then you're doing it much quicker. But still, there is a hefty chunk of time that you're spending in the game, and you're just like running from one place to another, but you're still listening to the game. Therefore, the ambient needs to change in a quick progression, in a quick prep, in a in a quick place. Each location has to have a different sound design, yeah, and. Mm-hmm. And then these locations are being connected into logical hole, and and this is your map, which means that actually you're dividing your map, you know, for a different locations. Then you can from then from three or four locations you can create a separate scene, and then and then you're moving to another scene which is divided to different location. This is actually mimicking what the guys are doing in the movie industry, yeah. So basically, when the camera changes the environment or where the action changes the environment, we have a different scene. If we have a different scene, very often we have a different lightning, we have a different mood, uh, we have a different audio. This is this is what I was trying to push in the Outriders, yeah? Just to divide the maps on the separate scenes and then divide these scenes into smaller chunks which contain exactly the same ambient theme but are... Mm, divided, uh, but are divided so that they provide a variety within within the same within the same thing. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, you know, this is like one of the one of the ways how to approach creation. First of all, very good contact with uh, with the guys who are designing the the game. Then next. Next thing is to talk on a regular basis to a level designers because these are the actual guys who are taking the ideas and they are putting them together on the map. And these are the guys who are actually putting together the whole world. Yeah. So stick to them, be be in frequent contact with 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 them, and this way will allow you to uh, in some cases to drive the gameplay via the audio because we had the cases when i was asking you know guys like for delaying a specific battle because i wanted to because i wanted the audio to fully play out yeah, yeah. for instance uh, let's say uh we had a situation uh, just the simple one we had a situation where the player was walking to the trigger and that trigger was playing the musical stinger which had like 30 seconds yeah but if the player was rushing then the stinger would only play in a half so i went to the level designer and i asked her yo can you move the battle a little further away can you extend the 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 road you know from the trigger to the to the actual battle so that you know we're gonna put the music in first place we're gonna play with the music yeah one of one of the examples, one of the simplest uh, uh, examples, yeah. So that's the one thing. That's the one thing that concerns the decoration layer of the game, yeah. The environments, the ambience, the things that help that are helping the players to immerse. How can you prepare for that? If you know the vision, if you know where the game will be taking place, and w- how the environments will look like. You can start pre-production of your own recordings. You can start doing specific field recordings. You can start producing assets which are targeted for the specific environments, yeah? Which means that we have a game and it's going to take place in the trenches, uh, in the civilized part of the world. Then we're moving to forest, which is kind of haunted, kind of spooky, kind of abstract, anomaly, and something, something which is not describable, <laughs> And then we're moving to the desert. Okay, so I know my environment. So I know, you know, the themes which are in the game. And then I can start preparing my stuff, yeah? Then I know what type of assets I will need, yeah? So that's the... I think that... I'm I'm hoping that this answers your question. (laughs) Yeah, 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 it did. So now, uh, next step is to fill this environment uh, with uh, enemies and creatures. And you guys have some awesome creatures that has awesome sounds. And... Yeah, thank you very much. uh, uh, How do you... You are actually looking and... 
you are third to cut you off, but you are actually looking at three creatures in the game. Yeah. <laughs> so how did you? Yeah, that's yeah, that's me and my voice. Come on, really awesome. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, but please continue. Third to cut you off. <laughs> so, uh, how did you approach that and uh, designing uh, creatures and also the enemies and what what kind of characteristic uh, did you wanted to uh, give them? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, in our trial, as we actually have two types of the enemies, we have a human one, three. Uh, we have human ones, yeah. Then yeah. we have the animals, and then we have the aliens at the end yeah. of the game. But the aliens are kind of similar to humans because they've, you know, mutated from the original aliens, so they are, so they are kind of, you know, these wild humans, yeah. But uh, firstly, we had to describe the games. The wild side of the game, of of the game, which means all the animals. Yeah, uh, usual approach. Talk to the design guys. Talk to the character artists. Find out the best that you can. Uh, find out the most that you can about the characters. Then try to try to uh, try to describe it with the sound. Yeah. Now, uh, initially, we took a very traditional approach. Which means, yeah, okay, we're gonna, you know, put some stuff from the animals, which is, you know, we have lots of animals in the libraries, so we're gonna put something together. Uh, of course, we also have our own field recorded libraries because I've been lucky enough to have my own field recording library of wild animals, including lions, tigers, and so on and so forth. Yeah, uh, yeah. Trip to Warsaw Zoo and <laughs> long trip to Warsaw Zoo, which <laughs> long lasted trip, for two yeah. months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mate! Like for two months, I've been on on a daily basis for two months. Uh, I've been like sitting in a zoo and trying to record as many animals as I could. That was actually before the Outriders, but <coughs> but it paid off because many of these recordings are still playing in the Out Outriders. Yeah. So we started with that kind of traditional approach, but something was lacking. And we had no idea what. Something was lacking, you know. Something was like not right because they sounded, they sounded cool, but they sounded like a uh, generic creature generator stuff. And we weren't satisfied. And after some time, we figured out that actually these guys, so these creatures in this world, used to be different. Right, what we are looking at right now is the stuff that comes from the anomaly. Yeah. So these creatures in the past look different. They have been transformed because of the anomaly, because that's how the anomaly works. So they need something distinct. They need something, I don't know, man, weird, different, abstract. You cannot describe the anomaly. The anomaly is the abstract force which uh explains lots of things in the in 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 the game therefore we figured out that okay these creatures need to sound abstract as well as 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 abstract as we can create them however they need to still remind the creatures they they still need to remind an animals okay so what can we do if you know doing it out of the library doesn't bring the good effects and i came with the idea that okay how about doing another kind of traditional stuff just like use your mouth it's like take the animation of the creature do something weird with your mouth then run it you know through the post process chain and then when you have your post process chain like set up in a correct way then start recording your live performance <coughs> to the animation on the screen yeah and this is how and this is what, how the performer came to life the small dog-like things, you know, with the with their comb being shaken, yeah? Uh, <laughs> this is actually the thing that I'm very proud of because that was one of the first things that I noticed on those creatures that they have this, you know, comb that is shaking yeah. when they're shouting. So I, so I figured out that, yeah, okay, this needs to be reflected by some... So actually, when you hear them sounding, you have this... These two sounds, yeah, combined together. And this way, you know, this is a perforo, yeah? So I started experimenting with the microphone and I recorded a bunch of stuff for the perforo. And it started to sound cool. 
because it sounded like an animal, but it was it sounded different. It sounded different because uh, because I was able to put some gibberish kind of words in 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 their screams or or in their sounds. Yeah, it sounded like a, like a language which before post-processing that but after yeah. adding a specific post-process it was converted for for that different for the different sounds that they are making yeah so that was the that, that was the process for the peripheral then the next thing i remember that was a peripheral alpha the giant one and the giant one need, needed to be different from the small ones yeah yeah basically I did exactly the same i took the mic i set up a different post-process chain and i played the different character and I played a d- different character with uh, <laughs> with actually uh, with actually sometimes uh, using Polish swear words just by <laughs> sheer accident. But sometimes, then when I did that, many of these things has been reversed and post processed, and it turned out to play pretty nicely. And that bloke was different from the little ones, you know. Wow. His tonality of the voice was different, you know, because. Actually, at the beginning, I was performing for the small creatures. So the pitch was higher. The phrases were shorter. You know, these are the small creatures. They are, they are the same stuff as the small dogs, yeah? So they will bark at you. But usually, you know, their voices are high-pitched plus short ones, yeah? But the, dog, but the big ones, when they start to bark, you definitely know it's a it's dog, yeah? And it's a big one, so that was the difference between the big perforo and the and the and the and the small one, yeah. So I so I did that, and, and it turned out pretty what I expected because they still sounded like an animals, but they had that something extra to them, and that something extra were bits and pieces of the gibberish being run through the post-process chain, yeah. Yeah. This gave them that kind of different feel than uh, the creatures being put uh, out of the usual animals, yeah? So, and when it worked with the Perforo, uh, we figured out that, yeah, we're doing that stuff for the rest of the creatures, yeah? So, for instance, you have that big boss forest fight, yeah? When you're entering the forest and, 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 you're, and you're fighting with that giant boss, which looks like a giant slug and, you know, moves around and so on and so forth, yeah? Oh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Oh, so everything, every vo- yeah, every voiceover that he says is like me. Uh-huh. And actually, I figured out that, yeah, since I was playing a little dogs and then the big dogs, so this time I can't play any of them. Okay, I need to do something different. What else to be done? Okay, <laughs> let's use the gibberish. Let's use the gibberish like 100%, yeah? Let's take the microphone and pretend I am Sauron from the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Why not, man? Uh, this, with a, with a dose of smart post-processing, turned out to be boss from the forest. And actually, when you're playing with, <coughs> when you're playing against him, yeah, he roars, he taunts, and so on and so forth. But that creature speaks to you also. It's like, you know, throw, he's shouting at you in his own language. I... I needed that thing to sound totally different than the rest of the of the of the of the animals because it's a, it's a completely different creature and it's unique. So it needed to sound unique. It it needed to stand out of the crowd, you know, in in the design and and, and I believe that in the lore as well that is one of the unique creatures on this planet. Yeah. So it needed to sound to, to sound different. The rest is exactly the same story. Every creature has been created by using the microphone. Uh, by Martin, uh, Martin Sobchak. He he was the second sound designer. So when <laughs> so I specifically remember we were working on the. I'm always forgetting the name of that creature. I think it's the lurker. It's the it's the big bloke who acts like a bully, who charges at, at at you. Yeah. Yeah. And Martin started to record. You know, stuff for him started to performing. You know, and he. And he asked me for the review, so we did some reviews. I wasn't like very happy with the direction, and and we we're always like, okay, do try something new, try something new, try something new. And I don't know after third trial or maybe fourth, uh, I just looked at that creature and I saw a bull in charging at me, and I said to much dude, how about you doing a cow thing? How about you mooing? 
And he's like, but why? And then I'm like, but man, look, this creature is charging at you. It looks like fucking bully, mate. You know, it looks like an angry bull who's gonna, you know, it's like kill you. And he's charging at you with very high speed. So it looks like a bull. Try this. Maybe it's gonna fit. So he took a microphone, you know, and and, and he did that. <laughs> and he ran it through a post-process chain, you know, and, and he called me like half an hour later, take a look, you know. And I took a look and I'm, yo, man, that sounds interesting. <laughs> Can we try more of this? And he's, yeah, man, it's, yeah, it's actually working out. So, you know, that's, that's, that's why, that's how the lurker came to life. You know, we just, we were just, we just noticed that, okay, this creature is fully charging at you. He's big, he's a big guy, you know, so <laughs> he needs to sound like, a, he needs to sound like a charging bully. Uh, to be quite honest, uh, when you're fighting with the enemies, because I'm very proud of, of, of their voiceovers, because uh, when you're fighting with the enemies, uh, despite of the fact that sometimes stuff is game gets very, very, very busy and you have a lot of them, I can still distinguish where are the perforos, where are the lurkers, huh. where are the skiatans, where are the where are the other creatures? Because our main goal, our main goal since the very beginning was okay, let's create something new and unique. Let's let's you know give these creatures a voices which are not created from the animals from the earth but also the second most important pillar of the whole venture was you need to be able to distinguish between all of them so if you're gonna hear a perforo audio you need to know that this comes from the perforo that this is a perforo this is not the lurker this this actually is the reality of our planet because if you hear a dog no matter if he's like small or big you know this is a dog if you hear a cow no matter if that cow is like big bison or a small car, you know that is a cow. So we were trying to mimic that. We were trying, you know, to put that very essence in the creatures. So to make sure that the communication to the player, because that was like the whole background and gameplay purpose, to make sure that the communication to the player is very clear. You know, our whole idea and our whole like basic mechanic vision for the audio in game was we need to communicate with the player because so there's a single channel of communication with the player, which is a visual one. Okay, that's the that's the one. But when you are in battle and there is mess around you and the game gets busy, sometimes you're not able to analyze all that information. And apart from that, how are you going to analyze something which is behind the camera? You ain't. You have no chance. But if this information will be passed through the sound then your battle awareness gets much higher. So if I am in the middle of the battle and I'm fighting with the Perforo and I'm hearing, and let's let's say that I'm playing on a 5-1, because that was like the 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 the, the goal, yeah? Because we've been mixing the game yeah. on a on a 5-1. So and when I'm fighting with the Perforo and I have them in front of me on the screen, and suddenly I'm hearing in the back speakers, you know, Marcin doing <laughs> Okay, I need to turn or I need to dodge because otherwise, because I know that someone is charging at me, you know? And this actually turned out to be pretty cool because it raised the battle awareness by the second communication channel, you know? Which is the, the audio. That was like our second goal, you know? To make stuff sound interesting <laughs> and then to, to communicate the, the to the player the battle situation because this helps a lot, yeah? And 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 I was pushing for that like really really heavy. I remember that we had to take a lot of tweaks to make sure that this communication works on a kind of decent level, despite of of the situations that the game gets very busy and you know there is a mess in the mix. Yeah. So yeah, that's the thing. That's ah. the thing. That's the thing about the the. Creatures, man. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about weapons and superpowers. Considering the looking, the the uh, looting system of Outriders, players have access to countless amount of weapons. How did you approach this section of the game? Uh, countless amount of web. Uh, okay, can you be more precise? Because because basically, players has access to different types of the weapons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I generally talk about the uh, we weapon design and the superpowers of the players. Okay, uh, as you notice, the Outriders is taking place in the world that is falling apart, to be quite honest. Yeah. We landed on the planet, it's supposed to be a paradise, yeah, but we ended up as 
usual. Yeah. Breaking stuff and, you know, fighting over the resources. Yeah, so this is a world which is similar to, let's say, Mad Max, something like that. That is the end of the road, you know, the, the humanity cannot survive. We're actually dying. We're losing that fight, you know. I don't know if you're aware of the, the there was a series, series of the book called Death Planet by Harry Harrison, I think. Let me double check. Let me yeah. quickly double check. You're going to cut it out. <laughs> yeah. Death Planet. I want to give you a proper death world. I think so. I think it's death world. One second. Uh, there's some general, yeah. Okay, there was a se- series of the books called Death World by yeah. Harry Harrison, kind of dystopian future. And the first of these books takes place on a planet where people landed. They did something terrible to that to the planet. They started, you know, slaughtering the animals. And in the in the turn of the events, the planet was trying to get rid of them, the planet itself, which meant that the new creatures evolved on the planet. The new creatures has been born and raised. They started attacking humans, only humans. And the global effort coming from this planet was to get rid of the humans because they are the parasites. Yeah? Yeah. At the end of the book, it turns out that the planet is kind of intelligent beast and so on and so forth. Yeah? Uh, now, when our main protagonist lands on this planet, by kind of the accident, when he lands on this planet, the humanity over there is more or less in the same place as we are in the Outriders. They are staying in the last human city. They cannot move outside of the of the walls of this city because everything is deadly around them. Uh, to make things more fun, these humans have uh, very nice weapons of destruction. Like, you know, hand cannons, which are able to blow the whole wall wall and so on and so forth. So they have like very, very, very powerful tools of um, destroying environment around them. Yet somehow they are losing with the, with the planet. Yeah, they are losing with the planet. And we are finding ourselves in Outriders in a similar place. But we are surrounded with the anomaly. We cannot move outside and everything is falling apart. This is exactly the same situation as, as was in this book. There's the last human remaining city. People are, people are, yes, united together, but they are fighting with the outside world. But meanwhile, everything falls apart on, on, on this planet and everything you know, goes south. Uh, when the people landed on this planet, they had like a fleet of spaceships. Right now, they have just a single one. Just a single one because they had to scrap the others you know, to get the parts for living on this planet. Yeah? And apart from that, an uh, interesting fact on that, uh, on, on, on that book was that that planet had a triple gravity of the Earth. So the humans were like, you know, super strong. Yeah. In Outriders, we don't have that, but the similarity is that actually everything falls apart. Everything is clunky, rusty. Uh, and what's the most important thing? It's not electronic. It's not modern stuff. It's the stuff that they brought from the Earth. It's still black powder weapons. Everything which is electronics you know, doesn't work because of the uh, anomaly. So no electromagnetic pulses or whatever. It doesn't work. The stuff that that we are using is rusty, clunky, heavy, you know, like that. And that was our approach. Let's create the guns, which sounds modern, but let's give the audio for the game that clunkiness, worn out feeling. Yeah. Yeah. That feeling that when you're shooting a pistol, okay, it's a powerful sound, but it's not clean. There is a dirt to that. And it is being, and I believe it is being reflected in every weapon and in every player's uh, ability. That was like our main, main vision. Actually mine, if I remember correctly. (laughs) I think that I was the one who came up with the idea of how to do it. And, 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 uh, and the recipe is like, yeah, kind of simple. You know, there's this, this magical word called saturation. 
Yeah. And the saturation sounds nice because yeah. it generates that, you know, nice harmonics, that yeah. tube warmth and so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay. It sounds nice. It sounds warm. But how about overdriving that saturation? How about oversaturating everything? Not distorting, just oversaturating. Yeah. Just, you know, pushing everything to the maximum. Yeah. But having in mind not to exceed that subtle threshold where sounds become so distorted. Yeah, it needs to be saturated. You need to hear that saturation. But on the other hand, you cannot exceed that. Uh, a good example would be a Justin Timberlake album created with uh, with Mr. Timberland. And it's from 2006. And the name of that al- album is Future Sex Love Sounds, I think. A lot of saturated sound on that on that album, you know, that actually that started kind of uh, kind of trend in the in the music industry for a while. Let's saturate the low end, <laughs> yeah. which is nice. I always like that. Yeah. And since my personal taste is that I like tons of bass <coughs> and I like saturation because it sounds very rock and roll ish. OK, let's put that in the game and see how it sounds, because in theory, because in theory, this should give us a feeling that actually everything is worn out, that everything is like clunky, yeah. it's not clean, it's it's always dirty because you're actually bringing the dirt to the audio signal, yeah? And I started experimenting with that on the player weapons, that was the, the, the first thing. And the next thing that, that uh, the next subject that I hit <laughs> was the early uh, player skills, yeah? Early yeah. prototypes for the player skills, yeah? So. Uh, so I came up, I came out with that concept that each branch of the of the player needs to sound a bit different, so that you can differentiate between the the, the types of the skills. Of course, everything needs to be saturated, and yeah. And I started with experimenting with the pure drum and bass sounds because <laughs> there's a lot of bass. <laughs> so overdriving and saturating, you know, these bass drops gave me that that these layers which sounded interesting enough which had a lot of har- harmonics they've been also again i need to let the cat eat one second touch no you just touch it cat sometimes i was like <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's my cat, man. <laughs> that's my cat. She was like outside. She was like walking. What's in her the name? Right, Mickey. Mickey. <laughs> her name is Mickey. Very simple. Right now, she decided that she's going. To... <laughs> so, uh, uh, where were we? Saturation. Saturation. Uh, saturation. Why do we, what's your place? favorite yeah, saturation plugin? <laughs> saturation plugin. Yeah. SPL tube vitalizer, TL audio stuff, TF Pro stuff. I work with the analog range of gear. Wow. Seriously. Oh man. Oh so mostly <laughs> mostly analog. But speaking about the VST, there is a thing which is called a saturation knob. And that is a PCF's yeah, yeah, most yeah. favorite plugin. <laughs> <laughs> this is not only PCF's most favorite plugin, man. It's like everybody uses that. Yeah. That thing is a wonder if when it comes to digital processing. I use Saturn but, from uh, FabFilter. Pardon? I use Saturn from FabFilter. That's my I'm, I'm just go-to. not using that. Yeah. I'm 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 just not using that. Yeah. You know, I, I wasn't exploring this field because Honestly, you know, since I work a lot with the analog with the analog wow, gear, yeah. that's like the <laughs> second part of the I'm the opposite. I'm completely the story, digital. Where to get that saturation from? <laughs> yeah, where to get that saturation from? So one thing was to you know create a proper post process chain in in my doll or in our dolls. But the second thing was to run everything through the analog. But I wanted to leave it for the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. We'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so look, getting back to 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 to, to stuff, uh, the ab- abilities had to be even more saturated. The very base for the abilities has been the drum and bass samples. Seriously, loads of drum and bass, you know, bass drops and all these acid bases. Yeah, so they served as a bev- as a very basic layers for the for some of the skills. Uh, Glow trap is 
So it's skill is the is the has the audio that has been designed at the very beginning of 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 of, of creation of the game. Low trap, the earthquake is the second one, which is like the oldest, and the third one is the rocket jump or the gravity leap. I yeah. think that's the name in the game. So these three are actually. So these three are actually the oldest ones, and they kind of came out of the very early stages of prototyping. So <laughs> these three kind of defined the the language of how the ability should sound. That everything should be oversaturated and totally over the the, the top, just to make player feel empowered over the environment. You know, so when your animation is backed up with a very very proper sound, which is like over the the top and works. With all the bandwidth and it's very strong and oversaturated, then it then you feel like like a half god, you know, because the sound is there and the sound is like packing up the the stuff. And and yes, answering totally your previous questions, how this has been achieved? Yes, by a lot of uh, saturation simulation plugins, which were tried and thrown away, and we ended up. We're using just the one called the saturation knob <laughs> in <laughs> in every possible place. <laughs> it sounds so smooth. So that's the one. And and yeah, and then I took like a big chunk of the of the main sound design for the for the player uh, for myself, and I use my analog toys. Yeah, because I have like a pretty vast collection of the analog outboard gear. So. You know, the drummer, the TL audio stuff, the, the TF Pro stuff. What else do I have? I do have warm audio pre preamps. I, I do have Neve, Neve. Uh, what's there? I would have to go to my to, to, to the studio to to give you the complete list. But what did I buy recently? Uh, recently I bought I bought the clones of the Pultex, Clark Technics. Wow. They cloned the 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 original EQ Pultex stuff and the and they are of course they are tube powered yeah so basically uh long time ago i decided that okay since i'm doing the audio i need a proper choice yeah so the plugins are the are one thing but it's good thing to have the analog gear why because it sounds different than a plugin it doesn't mean that it sounds better or something yeah. it's just different it's just a different stuff, yeah. Uh, and apart from that, the the good thing with the analog is that you can hit it with the plus sixty dB, which will overdrive the gear, and then it's gonna generate. Yeah. And then it's gonna really generate. You know, that's why the saturation, that's why the analog distortion is still sounds more crispier than the digital one because it's actual physics. What you're listening yeah. there, it's actual yeah. physics. So it's going to behave slightly different each time you 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 play. And, and apart from that, the analog generates a really nice distortion, really smooth, yeah? That's why I have a variety and of, of, a, of a different analog tools. And my main path, because uh, I'm using like two paths, yeah? One is like a fully digital, and and the outboard gear is fully analog. I don't own the digital outboard gear whatsoever. Nothing is like digital. The only digital thing allowed in my outboard gear is a um, presetting, <laughs> presetting stuff. <laughs> the Sansam do the Sansam does that 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 thing, which is very useful because you know you can recall that later on. But you can store the presets. But apart from that, the unit is unit is like fully analog. You know. So that's like my philosophy. Keep one side of the things fully digital and work with that domain. But if you're switching to the analog, stay in the analog. Why? Because it sounds different than uh, plugins. It's longer. It's not that convenient as a plugins. Furthermore, you need to create a vast documentation to be able to recall your presets. Yeah. Uh, luckily, these days we have a very, very decent smartphones with uh, with uh, nice cameras. So you know, each time you're doing a picture of a of your knobs setting, and 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 you can recall that you're just saving that with your session. Yeah, so so you can recall that. So uh, that was kind of my secret weapon on our try to create everything uh, saturated to reflect that clunkiness and greasiness of the world, but to create that saturation 
yeah, man, let's go analog. Let's go <laughs> in the same way as they did that in the 70s. You know, that's why the people are bragging so much about the 70s sound and so on and so forth. Yeah. yeah, there is something to it. There definitely is something to it. So I have like whole wall of that, of that, of that choice. And I'm using, honestly, I'm using them on a, on a daily basis. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Great, I'm great. That this answered your that this yeah. answered your question. A very challenging part uh, of making a game is the mixing part. What's your pipeline? And how do you tackle mix inside of a game? Most important thing for me is to have every piece of puzzle in the place before you start like a serious mixing. Yeah, because uh, then you know your levels, then you know your dynamics, then you know what needs to be, uh, what needs to be in front, what needs to be in the background, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So having that, uh, you can divide a mixing into separate stages. Uh, we decided to divide that mixing into three or four major parts, something like that. One of them was one of them was to make sure that the environmental sounds balance all over the game, which means that when you switch from map to map, everything stays at the same volume level. So that was the one thing. Second thing was to make sure that the game's mechanics, the the main sounds, the gunplay, the ability play, uh, is always on top because that was the main that was that is the most important communication tool uh, providing a battle situation awareness and then the third and the third part was to mix the music in to make sure that the music is always backing up the what is going on on the on the on the screen yeah uh, that said it doesn't mean that any of these parts has been more important than the other. Actually, everything was being run in the parallel, yeah? yeah. But having that separation allowed us to split the mixing into a few persons, yeah? So uh, one of us was responsible for mixing the ambience. Second, uh, second, guys was, uh, second guy was responsible for mixing the whole gameplay plus the uh, abilities. And the third one was responsible for mixing all the creatures, yeah? So, uh, see, that's the fourth part. <laughs> the creatures, yeah. And on and 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 on top of that, uh, we also <laughs> approached the mixing of the music, and that was like a float resource. Everyone was, you know, playing their part in the in the in the in in the whole puzzle, yeah. So after that stage, the game started to sound pretty decent, and then we switched to a. And then I became the owner of the general mix, which meant that having all the puzzles in place, all the assets playing in exact moments and in exact places where they're supposed to play, uh, I added the final touch, which was which actually was running through the whole game and you know uh, leveling the leveling the uh, stuff map by map by map by map by map. Having having always in mind that the gunplay needs to stay on top. Yeah. yeah. So to achieve that, uh, luckily the new Unreal has the DSP network, which allowed us to uh, use the compression and limiting uh, on a separate buses. Just of course everything has been divided into separate buses, which means separate categories. Yeah. Yeah. And that allowed us to keep a to keep everything within required levels, which which meant that no matter how many enemies you're gonna have on the screen, their total audio input will not be louder than specific than the specified value. Yeah, that they will always be a bit quieter, that they will always have that lower dynamic range than the player. Yeah, because the player is the the most important thing. So in so in in general, that was the main approach. You know, just to make sure all the puzzles, all the pieces are are there, all the scripted events are playing as they should play. Uh, the music is implemented. The music system is working in a proper way because uh, we also had the dynamic music system. Uh, and then mix each chunk of the game step by step, step by step, step by step. Generally, 
general the general rules applied to most of the game. However, in some cases, the things had to be tweaked manually. So yeah, this is it, and it took a long, 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 long time to achieve that final sound. You know, to achieve that final communication with the player where the sound serves as a second communication channel and provides you with the battle awareness situation. So that, you know, what is going on on the map, who is shooting you. For instance, we have a uh, we have a snipers that are targeting to you using the laser, yeah? And that laser has almost infinite attenuation so that you, so that each time the laser tag is like pointed at the player, you can hear this high-pitched sound, yeah? Yeah. And, uh, and, and we've been also experimenting. Sniper is a good example because we've been also experimenting on how to pass that information to the player. We've been trying various methods. And at the end of the day, the traditional approach, let's play high pitch loop, turned out to be the 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 best. Yeah. Yeah. Turned out to, to be the best because you know that was like transferring all the information to the player. I always knew uh if I'm being uh, uh, Tagged by a sniper because I heard that. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, the closer you get to the moment the sniper will shoot you, the pitch goes higher. Yeah. That's additional information. Yeah. So basically, that was the general approach to a mixing to provide as many informations as you can using the extreme the extreme cases the extreme battle arenas in the game when the game gets very busy and you have lots of people shooting at you plus the music playing yeah so these were the so these were the main points of 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 how to uh, approach the game because let's face it if if it's going to sound good when it's when it's get busy it's it's going to sound good you know when the game is called also a kind of old trick uh in battle situations ambience is being like darked out almost totally there is some ambience uh to prevent a silent gaps in the game when you have these short breaks in the yeah. in the fight but the ambience is like playing on the very low level so that you make way for the for the sounds that are the most important yeah to achieve that, we also had to construct a specific hierarchy of the. We had to also divide, you know, the sounds to the to the by their importance, yeah. And this was done using the the, the buses, yeah. Yeah. Plus usual side chain, side chaining, compression, yeah. side chain ducking, <laughs> yeah, 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 whatever you can, you know. If the grenade lands uh, very close to you, okay, it's gonna side chain the. It's the. It's gonna duck side chain the. All the all the enemies, yeah. So uh, I believe that this technique is called mixing in a time window, because uh, you're not using the all of, all of the dynamic range. Because let's face it, you know, when the game gets busy, it's gonna get loud, yeah. So you cannot pass all the all the in- information when everything is like super loud. However, you can mix the game using a time window, which means that in a specific amount of in a specific place in time, you're supposed to hear specific sounds which are the most important for the current situation in the in the in the gameplay arena yeah so that's why uh, some of the sounds from the creatures has been ducking the the other sounds so some some of the sounds uh, from the from the human npcs has been ducking the other sounds and so on and so forth yeah but the main idea was that okay we're keeping the player on top always the audio coming from the player needs to be on top which means the abilities and the and the player gunplay is like always on 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 top. That's our main layer, and then there is the rest, and then there is you know the NPC stuff, uh, the 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 creature stuff plus the music, which needs to illust- illustrate the battle situation. Yeah, plus of course uh, good old uh, fiddling with the EQ, making sure. That the band that 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 uh, specific buses do not uh, overlap with each other, yeah. Which meant, uh, for instance, that meant cut the uh, cut the low end from some of the enemies uh, because if there's too much low end on on them, it's gonna mat the mix, yeah. <laughs> and this process took a long time to 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 bring a game to its to its final shape. But you know, let's face it, the game is big. 
Yeah, exactly. So yeah, basically in a very short. That's the thing, man. Very educational, man. I've been taking notes here. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, um, uh, what are some of your? Uh, I mean, we talked about. Uh, so, what are some of your uh, favorite games uh, regarding sound? If I will say Battlefield, I will be like a uh, that's regular not, boat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what can incredible. I say? They made it really nice, man. Yeah, yeah. Incredible. <laughs> they they made it really nice, but uh, but you know they made it really nice in terms of the battlefield mechanics, yeah, of the of the of the information awareness. So that's so that's like outstanding uh, achievement because everything is kind of super clean, yeah. The, the the distances are are there. You can differ, differentiate between the NPC, uh, between someone being close to you or between someone being very distant from you, and so on and so forth. So, but that's like one side of the coin. Uh, uh, but also, you do have games which uh, are driven by narrative sound design. One of the good examples would be Limbo. The old game, but the audio there was like wow, top notch, because everything was driven by yeah. by the sound, which was bringing the uh, proper feelings uh, corresponding to what you have seen on the on the screen. Yeah, so that's that's the thing. Yeah, that's the yeah. thing. <laughs> uh, what else? If I will say Doom, I will be just a regular guy who likes the audio on the Doom because it's great. Because <laughs> it's great, and to be quite honest, the audio on the Doom is very stereo uh, in some cases, yeah. Because the Doom also tends to get gets very busy, but the amount of sounds being generated by the enemies is not overwhelming. Therefore, yeah. you have a room, you have a headroom. For your for your main gunplay, you know, so that's like just the trick to balance out the the, the stuff, yeah. Plus, usually you have the battle music, which backs up action on the screen, yeah. So the more adaptive battle music you can create, the more modular battle music you can create, the better for the mix, because you because you know then you can stack up the tension on the on the battle music yeah if the if the battle on the screen is like not the not the highest of its tier then you don't have to play all the layers yeah if the if the battle gets busy then you're switching additional layers and and you're just making sure that the music cuts through yeah that's like one of the biggest challenge create challenges while creating the shooting games with loads of things going on how yeah. to make sure that player will be able to hear what the music is playing? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what are you, some fa your, your favorite movies regarding sounds? My favorite movies regarding sounds. Oh man, load of them, <laughs> load of them. Uh, I will. Uh, I will answer that in a kind of kind of different question. Uh, Interstellar. Yeah. Yeah, maybe not regarding sounds, but regarding the soundtrack, because that thing is oh, yeah. a beast, man. That's like yeah. wow, yeah. very, 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 very good stuff. And the music illustrates the the epicness of the movie. You know, the sheer size of the space surrounding you. The and and it you know passes the message of how small humans are, actually. Exactly. And the music plays like very significant role in in that movie. Maybe it doesn't concern the sound design as 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 is, but I believe that uh, without this soundtrack, this movie wouldn't sound that great. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So so that's the one thing. So that's the one thing. Second thing. A uh, long time ago, I noticed that when the Transformers series came out. Uh, I noticed that uh, okay, they provided a load of interesting sounds based on the original series. But uh, I also noticed that in second on, on or the third part of the transform, they also focused on a similar technique mixing in a time window, which meant that when the 
busy action was getting on the screen, when the fights were getting on the screen, the sound designers were focusing only on the most important sounds, which were being triggered in a chronological order. Yeah? yeah, without all the surrounding ambience and so on and so forth, they were just just the main sounds. So if the if the truck was hitting, you know, the ground, and after that, that truck was picked up by one of the transformers, and then he was like shooting mm-hmm. through that truck, you could you could only hear bouncing of the truck, then transformers grabbing that car, and then his shot, and the rest was like ducked, yeah, mixing in time. We know even but, the music but, was but, cut but, off. And yeah, well, again, Steve Jablonski was uh, the composer uh, of those movies again. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, by the way, cutting the music off first, the first time I, I, I really noticed that was the Lord of the Rings, actually. Yeah, 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 uh, exactly. So, uh, and you think it's the, continuing, the, it's like, oh, yeah, the music is there, but it's actually not there, and it comes afterward. Yeah, uh. The, the best example was, I think, that in the third part of the Lord of the Rings, the Return of the King, when the Rohirrims are uh, are backing up the defense of the Minas Tirith, yeah? Yeah, yeah. And then there is this scene, you know, showing the hordes of the Rohirrims and the music is pumping up everything, you know, the music is getting more pompous and pompous and pompous. And then they are start charging, they're, you know, riding their horses. And the moment they are hitting the orcs, The music is totally cut out. Exactly. And and for the next 30 seconds or one minute, you know, just hear only the sound design playing, only yeah. the audio, and then the music kicks in very, very slowly. That is that was very nice technique, you know, just to bring the tension to the maximum scale, and then instead of bringing it even higher, just like drop it completely for some short period of time, and then get back to the music. Yeah, that creates flow. contrast. So, Exactly, you know, that creates yeah. contrast and that creates a good counterpoint, and which means that the people are actually paying attention to what is going on within a, uh, within a time do, 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 uh, with a sound domain. Yeah, yeah speaking of uh, the, the Transformers, uh, Eric Adele, who was the lead sound designer of uh, Transformers, did also Godzilla vs. Kong, which was fantastic. I don't know if you've seen it or not. Nope. Yeah. Unfortunately, nope. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna love it, man. It has some similarities to too many Outriders. movies. Not enough time, man. <laughs> Look, yeah. too many movies. Not enough time, you know. Yeah. So that's like you know that's that's <laughs> actually I'm actually I'm not alone in in this because actually when I'm asking you know the brothers in arms uh, from the game development industry everybody complains about the same shit. We don't yeah. have time to play games anymore. <laughs> Yeah. We don't have time to play movies, yeah, to watch movies anymore. Why? Because we are making games. Because we are busy with making the the, the stuff. Yeah. So come on, flow. You know, everybody <laughs> YouTube's uh, games these days. Yeah. <laughs> But you know, the day has only 24 hours, and sometimes, and you know, somehow you have to cope with that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, do you have any advice for upcoming sound designers new new to the industry? <laughs> Honestly, uh, <laughs> chase your dreams, man. <laughs> chase your dreams. You know, if if you like what you're doing, just go for it. Just go for it. Educate yourself. Okay. Most important, listen. Listen to the stuff. Listen, listen as much as you can. If you wanna work as a guy who uh, is connected with the audio, do not limit yourself to. You know, listening the music only, just listening as listen as many stuff as as many things as as you can. You know, don't don't limit yourself to a music. Just like try to 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 listen because when you're listening, uh, after some point, you are learning how to critically listen. Yeah, how to pay a, a attention to the most important aspects uh, of what needs to be transferred to your. To your listener, to 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 the receiver, and this and this, you know, help will will help you to pass that crucial information so that people can understand what you're trying to say via via your via your audio. So that's the one thing. And the second thing, practice, man. Just you know, if you have if you have ideas for something, just go grab a reaper. It's very cheap, uh, and you know, play with it, create create weird stuff. 
then uh, then if then if you're satisfied with what you created, why not you know trying to poking it up with the with the picture? Why not you know trying to download a piece of the gameplay from some game or or just taking a piece of a movie and you know sound designing it by yourself? Why not replacing the sound design, the original sound design with 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 yours? To be quite honest, I'm seeing a hefty amount of such things over the internet where people are replacing the original sound design with with their own and very often they are achieve very great results you know and uh, very often these people are not the professionals they are just the amateurs you know because they are playing with because the, they are playing with with that and very often it leads to very interesting results you know so yeah man what what can i say educate yourself the more you know the quicker your work will be done, the more you will focus on uh, implementing your actual vision instead of fiddling with the technicals. Yeah. Yeah. My my advice would be listen to this conversation over and over and learn from this guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm hoping that you're gonna edit that conversation because we're talking a lot and the and the lads will get bored, man. Trust there, me. There is no editing, man. It's a raw cut, man. It's a Marson cut. So, dude, okay. you, you're amazing. You're, no, you're... I'm saying that my best shots won't end up on a cutting floor, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. All right, man. You're awesome. Your entire career is inspirational. And personally, I always look up to your Thank fantastic you work and try to elevate myself accordingly. This has been an amazing opportunity and an education for me. Thank you so much. And have a beautiful night, sir. <laughs>